Hey, what's up church? Hey, this is Pastor Andrew here. I'm here at the Mount Fredericksburg. And let me just show you what your generosity has been able to do as we've launched this campus right here in Spotsylvania County and for the Fredericksburg area. Let's take a look inside. Hey, I'm right here in our guest services area, our main lobby, and we're getting ready to do our first service in just a few minutes. In fact, right over here, we got our Sugar Shack Donuts, and our incredible team of volunteers are here. They here every Sunday to make sure to greet people and welcome them and to connect them here in the space. Hey, let's go take a look at what's happening over in our family ministry area. All right, guys, let's take a look at our incredible children's area for our family ministry of Kids at the Mount. And here, uh, man, we really are for one more kid right there, for one more kid. And every single Sunday, we see close to 100 kids coming right here at, at Kids at the Mount here in Fredericksburg. And our incredible team of volunteers, man, they love on these kids, they mentor these kids. Now let's head over to our student ministry area and take a look and see what's happening up there. All right, this is our student ministry area. This is one of our incredible volunteers right here. And each week we'll see 15 to 20 kids up here. Man, again, just building relationships, going to connect with one another. And this is a safe space for students to meet, connect about God, connect with each other. We even have an ear hockey table. Come on, people. It's awesome. All right, now let's go check out our auditorium and see what's happening down there. All right, hey everyone, I'm here in our auditorium. Again, we have all these volunteers around, our usher team and our ABL team right over there. And then our worship team is gonna be up on the stage in just a few minutes getting ready. Man, this is our main space where each week we're seeing well over 200 people between two services gather on Sunday morning. And to think already, we've just been open since Easter and we've already seen 36 decisions for Christ, 11 baptisms come right here out of this space. So we're so excited to see what God God's going to do as we continue to meet here and continue to show the community that we are indeed for them. Come on, put your hands together. Let's tell Fredericksburg how much we love them. Hey, listen, in the month of December, we want to give you some snapshots of what your giving is doing. And I want you to know your generosity is making a difference. We are now down in a whole new community and we're seeing already the fruit of taking that step of faith uh, at what that is, is doing uh, as we continue to move out in faith. Can I just tell you, Stafford Campus, thank you, thank you, thank you, because your giving is making this possible. Hey, listen, speaking of generosity, I, I know that some of you are going to get bombarded with people that know you come here to this church, and, and we didn't mean for this to happen, but because you're generous and you give, we often are trying to look at ways that we can make a difference locally in our community. And so this last week, uh, Pastor Andrew down in Spotsylvania County and Pastor Jerry up here in Stafford County, we went and we retired some school lunch debt for families that are struggling. And as we did that. Listen, we, we weren't trying to be covert with it. We just see the needs and we wanted to respond on your behalf. And so we retired about $17,000 worth of school debt. And by sharing that, it's gone viral. And we didn't mean for it to do that. So if we ever become known for something, I want you to know clearly we're trying to make Jesus famous, okay? So if you get asked, hey, I heard about your church and what you did, what an opportunity for you to make Jesus famous. Listen, the reason we give is because he gave. And so anytime we can be generous, I believe it shows the world what God and his relentless love looks like. And so I just wanted to give you kind of a little bit of an update on that church. But thank you, thank you, thank you for your heart, your belief in the mission, and your continued giving. May we continue to grow as God finishes this year strong with us. Well, today we are going to begin our Christmas series. And I love it. I love it. it like Andy said, man, we got here quick. The way the kind calendar kind of worked. It's like, you're kidding me. We're two weekends away from our outreach services before we invite our, our community to come and experience Christmas at the Mount. I can't, I can't believe it. We're already there. Yet, I know some of you, it's not hard for you to get there because come on, some of y'all here today, you're Christmas people. Some of y'all, y'all love the season of Christmas. Come on here at Stafford, Fredericksburg. Who, who's Christmas people all the way? Come on. You can't wait to decorate the house. Can't wait for the lights. Can't wait for the, every room 
room to kind of transform. Come on, my wife's a Christmas person. She loves the holiday of Christmas. And so it has gone large. Is, is that your house? Anybody got it, got it? Listen, I'm all for Christmas and I love what my wife does, but I'm a questioning a little bit at the inflatables in our front yard. I'm just gonna say, I, I, I think yeah, we're getting a little bit crazy in there. Do we need to have that guy on the front lawn? That's sand, you know, I, I'm just thinking, but, but listen, some of y'all, that's easy for you to jump to that time. Listen, how many of you love Christmas music? Come on. Some of y'all started back in October listening to this stuff, right? You're like, I can't get enough of it. How many of you got traditions, right? Where you watch certain shows every year and your family, let's get together. We watch this together. Yeah. And you got these kind of memory. Listen, my wife this year, she found the Hallmark Christmas show. Don't clap at that one. Listen to me. <laughs> I don't know how she found this, but I'm telling you, it is on nonstop at our house. And, and I just want to tell her, you know, this is not real, right? This is about as real as WWE wrestling, right? This is not real life. And listen, I've even gotten drawn in to watch some of the shows. And the more I watch, I realize they all are the same. They end up together eating Christmas cookies on Christmas Eve. It doesn't change, right? But listen, I don't know if you're all in for Christmas or not, but Christmas, come on. In the Bible, Christmas is an invitation into joy. And yet, even as we prayed today, so many people, they struggle with experiencing joy, especially at Christmas where it's supposed to be a time of what God can do and wow, he puts things back together. Some of us, it's a reminder of what is broken or what is missing. So we're gonna do a series. I hope that you'll, I hope that God will be personal with you in it. We titled it, No Joy, No Joy. Can you see it? No joy, no joy. And there's a tension in this Christmas story. Now, where we're gonna begin in the Christmas story is we're gonna back way up into the story and I want you to help me find in the Old Testament this little four chapter book called Ruth. And that's where we're gonna begin our Christmas story this year, all the way back in Ruth. Now listen, there's no shame in looking at the table of contents because this is a small little book. After the book of Judges, before 1 Samuel, find it there because I want you to see what God wants you to see today in his truth. Hey, listen, if you're a guest with us, welcome to our Stafford campus. Come on, if you're a guest with us, welcome to our Fredericksburg campus and welcome to all of you watching online. Come on, God, would you speak today through your living scriptures in this little book called Ruth. Now, as you're turning to find Ruth, let me share some inspiration with you. Uh, this last year, I took a group to Israel, and as we got to go and experience the Bible in living color, uh, we had a chance to leave kind of the secure area of Israel and to go into a Palestine area, and we got to physically visit Bethlehem. Now, why is that important? Because the setting of Bethlehem is where we're going to anchor our story this Christmas. And yet we're going to find it not just where Jesus was born, but we're going to back all the way up to Ruth. Now, here's what was significant. As we got to that place in Bethlehem, we went to this lookout area called the Shepherd's Field. This is where we historically believe the angels came and came to the outcast, right? Came to these dirty shepherds, tending sheep in the field, and this is where they announce good news has come, right? Joy to the world, a savior has been born and his name is Jesus. And yet our tour guide, as he's talking about the shepherd's field, he said, there's another name for this field. It's called the field of Boaz. Now, as we walk through Ruth, you're gonna hear about a guy named Boaz and the wealth of Boaz. And when I was there in Israel, I'm going, boom, this is a Christmas moment for me. I said, I know exactly where the Holy Spirit's gonna lead us this Christmas. We're gonna go to the book of Ruth. And on that day, when we were at the shepherd's field, I took a missionary, uh, Jason Cheesejell. Come on, we love Jason and Lakin, right? They were here for a short season and we took, I took Jason with me on this, on this trip to Israel. And I said, Jason, you're gonna give the talk in the shepherd's field. He gave the most powerful devotion that day in the field of Boaz. 
Now, why am I saying all that? Because the last Sunday of the year, we're gonna have an online experience. We're gonna bless all of our amazing volunteers and we're not gonna meet here, we're gonna meet virtually. And I've asked Jason to share this message that he shared in Israel. And I, I want you right now to make plans wherever you are, if you're traveling, get online that day. Come on, give us about 15, 20 minutes. Have that worship service with us. And I promise you, you're gonna be encouraged by what you hear. So I just give you that little commercial before the commercial, right? Right? But today, we're going to go to the story of Ruth. Now, what makes this story kind of interesting is that Ruth is a bridge. Before this, we hear about God building a nation through the family of Abraham. Come on. He's building a nation out of Abraham. And then, as we move through the story of Ruth, we go from being led by judges, because that's where it begins, and it ends with the beginning of them having kings. So if you know how this fourth chapter works, it starts with the time of judges, and it ends with the lineage of King David, the most famous king in the Old Testament, right? And so in the interest of this, I want you to learn something this Christmas. Can y'all learn something with me? And I want us to begin to connect the dots to maybe a greater story that God is telling. So here we go. I'm gonna read a lot of scripture today because God's word is still speaking. You believe that? Here we go. Ruth chapter one, verse one. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Now, famine, obviously a scarcity of food. These are financial days, financial challenging days. But not only that, being able to sustain your family. This is serious business. So a man from, and look at where he lived. Come on, from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, they decide to make a decision. Because of the famine, they decide to leave and go to another country, the country of Moab. Now the man's name was Elimelech. Elimelech means my God is king. Isn't that irony in the story? My God is king. I trust him, right? But I don't trust him in this famine. Let's go to another country and let's go find some food for our family. Just kind of a pause there, right? And yet Elimelech has a wife. Her name is Naomi. We find out later that the name Naomi means the name pleasant. They have two sons, Malon and Kilion. And they're Ephrathites from Bethlehem. There's that name again. And they went to Moab to live there. Now, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, while they were there, he dies. Now she is left in this foreign country with her two sons. They continued to live there. And the Bible tells us that they married Moabite women. One named Orpah or Oprah, right? In the original language, this means talk show host. <laughs> just joking, just joking. And the other name, her other daughter-in-law is named Ruth. Now this name does mean friendship. After they lived there for about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion, her sons, they pass away, they die. Now, Naomi was left without her two sons and without her husband. Are you feeling this yet? You feeling the tension of the story yet? Listen, this story starts off with financial challenges, starts off with a famine. It continues with a funeral, a death of her husband. Now she's a, a widow. And then 10 years, some good things happen. Her sons get married, even though they married Moabite women, right? And then something tragic happens again. On top of losing her husband, she now loses her sons. Can, can you feel the weight of this story? Hey, both campuses right now, because we're talking about Bethlehem, turn to your neighbor and say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, right? It doesn't this feel like tension? <laughs> but isn't that oftentimes what you might feel, maybe not to this extreme, but you come into a season of Christmas and instead of the joy that we talk about being invited into, you're maybe experienced the opposite of joy. Maybe somebody can relate to that today. Now, let's just keep reading. Come on, God's word is good, is it not? Yes. 
It says this, when Naomi heard all the way into Moab, she heard that the Lord had come to aid his people, come on, her people, by providing food for them. So she came up with a plan. She and her daughter-in-laws prepared to return home all the way from there. With her two daughter-in-laws, she left the place where she had been living and she set out on the road that would take them all the way back to the land of Judah. Now, Naomi, she says to her two daughter-in-laws, go back, each of you, go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. She kissed them goodbye. They all wept out loud together and said to her, we will go back with you and to your people. But Naomi said, no, return, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I gonna have any more sons who can become your husbands? No, return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they all wept out loud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law, she's going back to her people. She's going back to her gods. Go back with her. But look at what Ruth replied. Listen how she replies. She said, don't urge me to leave you, to turn back from you. Where you will go, I will go. Where you will stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you will die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So here they are, two women, went on until they came to where? Come on. Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be, can this be Naomi? She said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me and the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Come on, is God's word speaking today? The hour is 1050 BC, a thousand years before Jesus is gonna be born in a manger in Bethlehem. We start in a place of Bethlehem, but I want us to go into the story today because as we lean into the word of God today, I want you to feel kind of the the arc of where we're gonna look at in these four short chapters over these next three Sundays before we enter into a time of Christmas at the Mount. Here we go, let me give you the first tension point here. When life is rooted in circumstances, life can become bitter. You know that, right? But the same tension is this. When life is rooted in faith, come on. When life is rooted in faith, life can experience joy 
regardless of the circumstances. You know what I believe today on both campuses and even online is that there's some people here that are in one of those tension points, rooted in circumstances or rooted in faith. And then the rest of us might be somewhere in between the two tensions of the story because life is hard. Circumstances are heavy and it's easy to be in a wrestling match and wanting to experience the joy we're talking about, but not really yet experiencing it or feeling it or thinking it personally. Listen, I want you to know today and asking the question, what is your life rooted in? What is your life? Where is your life rooted in? Are you feeling blessed today or are you feeling broken today? Are you are you experiencing the blessing of God or are you experiencing the brokenness of your own circumstances? I believe today, whether you're determined or discouraged, whether you maybe are sensing bitterness, today God wants you to take a step towards better. And I think it's possible in what we're gonna do today. Listen, we're gonna talk about how to know joy over these next few Sundays together. And I'm telling you today, you can't know joy until you know how to battle bitter. I can't even say that today, how you could battle bitter today. And so in this theme today, I I need a little bit of backup. And so I hope y'all can help me and join me today. I'm gonna invite Katie Hawkins to join me in preaching this message today. Come on up, Katie. And as my friend, my sister's coming to the stage. Many of you might not know Katie Hawkins, but let me give you one detail about her life and about her story that can maybe help somebody relate to her today. Listen, either campus Katie uh, has been a faithful sister and part of this church for many years, but this last year she's been walking a hard road, and this is my word, I believe she's been walking a dark road this last year, battling breast cancer. And so I've asked her to help join me in the story as we look at Naomi today and talk about this idea of battling bitter. I asked her to join me in the conversation of the scriptures today and, and to share a little bit about her story and be vulnerable today. And so come on, both campuses again, help me encourage and welcome Katie Hawkins today. Thank you. I have to be honest with you all though. When Todd asked me to share my cancer story as it related to Naomi, I'm like, wait a minute. Wasn't she an old lady that was blaming God for (laughs) ruining her life and wanted all her friends to call her bitter? I'm like, Todd, do you think I'm all (laughs) bitter and mad at God? But, But then I looked at her story and I thought, what does my story have in common with hers? And all stories, if they're good ones, have elements in common. Obviously they have a beginning, a middle and an end and they always include some kind of conflict because conflict is really what moves the characters forward and forces them to grow in some way. But there's always hope woven into the conflict, and then there's always resolution at the end. Some kind of rescue, some kind of salvation, redemption, Mm -hmm. resolution. So in Naomi's story, um, Todd, you set it up perfectly, her outer conflict really was the death of her son, her two sons, and, and her husband. And So because of that outer conflict, life-changing traumatic event, she makes a decision to move. Move back into community, move back to Bethlehem. And to me, that is a courageous step. I think Naomi was a woman of faith before this huge trial came. Even though she was living in Moab amongst people that were worshiping false gods, I think she hung on to her faith in the one true God because otherwise how would Ruth know all about her God and her people? So Naomi must have been teaching her and the scripture you read, you see her referring to God. So she believes in God, she has faith, but she comes up against this trial that is just hard. And so that's the outer conflict, but then you see the inner conflict within her. And basically, I think she was struggling with two things, her identity and her theology. Kind of thinking, okay, I'm not a wife anymore, I'm not a mother anymore, I'm not a homemaker, I can't be the breadwinner, so who am I? 
Mm. And she's like, I'm certainly not pleasant <laughs> anymore. Mm. I'm bitter. So she struggles with, am I enough? Mm. And um, in her identity. But then she also is struggling with her theology because although she has faith and she believes in God, she really honestly thinks that God has ruined her life, mm -hmm. that God is punishing her, that these bad things have happened because somehow she deserved <laughs> bad things to happen. Um, so, but despite her outer conflict and her inner conflict, she moves forward. She moves into community, and there's resolution, which Todd will talk about in upcoming weeks, <laughs> so don't miss it. But there is redemption and rescue, and at the end, there's so much joy because you see that God himself was writing a bigger story, a story with eternal value, and Naomi's mini story was just part of that. Um, so how exciting is that? But that's Naomi's story. How does my cancer story kind of um, fit in with that? Well, there's beginning, middle, end. Beginning, my outer conflict was when I was diagnosed with this really aggressive type of breast cancer. And I was with a bunch of people from Mount Ararat down at this conference when I got the bad news. Specifically, I was rooming with Susan Wanderer and her and I have been doing this podcast together where we would interview women with really hard stories. And yet they would always come through somehow with joy. And the element was always God is the hero, rescuing, redeeming, and, and then their faith. So that night in the hotel room, I said, Susan, I'm really not asking God, oh, why me, why me? I'm kind of thinking, why not me? <laughs> I think it's my turn to have the hard story. But I also was thinking, God is just going to save me. He's going to rescue me. And I'm a woman of faith, so I'm going to have joy when I go through this trial. So, Todd, you don't remember this, but we came to you the next day, and we were even kind of excited. We're like, hey, we're going to make a podcast episode about this diagnosis. We're going to have Becca sing, resting in the Father's arms. It's going to be so good. And you turned to me, and you said, that's great, but just don't be glib, Katie. <laughs> glib. <laughs> I don't remember you using that, that word. I didn't say that. He said it. He said it. Don't be glib. Glib. And I had to ponder. And I kind of thought, what does that really mean? But I realized what you meant was don't be naive about what you're going to face because none of us really knows how we're going to face a hard trial until it's upon us. And once I started treatment, this chemotherapy they put me on. Uh, one of the drugs was nicknamed the Red Devil, and it literally was like hell itself had descended into my body mm. and my soul. I was so dark and sick and depressed, and I really did lose all my joy, along with all my hair. This is a wig, <laughs> false eyelashes. If something falls off while I'm up here talking. <laughs> Don't, don't be shocked. May nothing fall <laughs> off in Jesus' name. <laughs> I've already prayed that. <laughs> but I lost my joy, and I lost the faith that I had in my own self for, for going through this trial with, with great joy. And I found myself, because of these outer conflicts, with the same kind of inner conflicts, that Naomi was going through, specifically wrestling with my identity. Yeah. Am, am I enough? And my theology, is, is God enough? <laughs> Who is he really and how does he interact with people? First of all, identity. Um, I obviously didn't lose my people like Naomi did. So positionally, I was still a wife and a mother and a grandma and a friend and a you know, member at Mount Ararat, but I could not function in those roles yeah. at all. And I felt so worthless, so valueless, so mm -hmm. empty, so unlovable. And I kind of wonder 
if that's really what Naomi was thinking at first, I'm useless, I'm worthless. But then the more she rehearsed it, the more it hardened into this mm. bitterness. I, I don't think I would have called myself bitter, but I would have said I'm a, I'm a big bother wow. to people because I can do nothing for nobody. That's bad grammar. I can't do anything for anybody. Sure. <laughs> so what value do, do I have struggling with identity? And the irony of that is, prior to this cancer season, I used to teach women about how important it is to center your identity simply in who, your relationship with Christ and who he says you are. My favorite book to teach was Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord Always. Joy despite circumstances. How do you have joy? Does, and I would teach this. How do you have joy without the sure. circumstances? Know that you are his beloved child, that you were created in his image for his glory. That's your purpose here, that he adores you. You're the apple of his eye. And I would teach this. I believed it, it wasn't hypocritical, but I had absolutely no idea how to make that applicable until he stripped everything away mm -hmm. that I really had inadvertently put value and self-worth mm -hmm. in. And I had nothing left except my relationship with him. And I had to ask, is that enough? Am I, enough, Am I enough? And I realized I'm not enough if I'm going to put my value and self-worth in what I can produce, my, the roles that I can play, what I think people are thinking of me. I'm not enough. I'd never be enough. Yeah. But I am enough if I'm going to center my identity in who he says I am. Sure. Now, that rolls right into struggling with theology. Yeah. Like Naomi, she's like, well, this God I believe in has ruined me. He's punishing me. He is against me. If that is my theology and what I think about God, how am I ever going to center my identity in being his beloved child who he's for and not against? Mm -hmm. Because I would think, well, he's against me. And then that just, do you see how that doesn't make sense? Now, most of us would not say we believe that, that God is ruining our life with these trials, but if we're dead honest, I think all of us at some point that creeps in. Yeah. It's like, what have I done to deserve this, God? Why are you against me? You could have made this not happen. I think we all kind of struggle with that. And as a matter of fact, one of the most meaningful conversations I had right after my diagnosis with, with someone very close to me, and she said, I can't even pray anymore because I honestly feel like God is punishing me for some decisions I've made, some mistakes I've made by killing you with cancer. Wow. And that, oh, that grieved my heart. And I'm like, hey, let's talk about this. Let's think about this. Is that what God is like? Mm. And I said, you know what? No, that isn't what he's like. That isn't how he treats us. And she said, well, how do you know that? I know it because Jesus Christ came to earth to show us all what God the Father is really like. And Jesus showed us. God is kind. God is love. He is for us, not against us. He is a forgiving, loving, good God all the time. And as a matter of fact, Jesus even taught against this particular theology because they brought this blind man to him one time and they said, hey, who sinned? This, this guy or his parents? that he has to have this terrible conflict. And Jesus said, neither. This happened for the glory of God. Right. In other words, this happened because God himself is writing a bigger story. And just using this conflict in this man's life for the bigger, for the bigger story. So theology, how you think about God, is he enough? Yeah. Can we... Trust him that he is writing a bigger story and we're just, we're just part of it. Yeah. Let me break in in a minute. And Katie, I think what you're sharing is huge because 
all of us are going to go through some kind of trial or circumstances, no matter what the level of it is. And you're making Naomi a lot more relatable. It is too easy to, to look at a story like this and put our arms together and say, look at old Naomi. And she can't get her <laughs> life together. But let's just, let's just kind of walk a little bit of Naomi's shoes. If we had all the loss that she had in that decade, where would we be standing today? Mm-hmm. What would we be saying today? What will we be feeling today? What will we be experiencing today? And yet somehow we look at this because listen, circumstances will always lead us to these feelings and these doubts. That's just inevitable. Yet left alone, we'll end up at a place of bitter. But what if we look at Naomi and say that even though she was thinking this, even though she was feeling bitter, she came back to Bethlehem. Is that not huge? She's stepping beyond what she's thinking. She's stepping beyond what she's feeling. She steps beyond even the bitterness in her life and she comes back to the community that she needed to be reconnected to. And so if we wanna look at some courage today, you gotta know joy. Come on, note takers today. I'm gonna give you some anchors here today in the message of what Naomi shows us and what Katie's saying out loud to us because if we're gonna know joy, we gotta know how to battle bitter. We got to know how to battle bitter. Here we go. Number one, here's what was said. You got to be honest. You got to be honest. Honest about what? Honest about your feelings and about your doubts. And I I think it kind of goes directed to a couple of places. Number one, take it to God. The Psalms are filled with people bringing their feelings and doubts to God. Read the Psalms and you'll see it again and again and again and again and again. People being raw and loud and talking and listening to God. But you know who else you need to have? You need to have some close, trusted people that you can be vulnerable enough to say, here's what I'm thinking and feeling. Here's my doubts right now. You need those people in your life. And then in addition, you know who you need to be honest with about your feelings and doubts? You need to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think we're the ones going, I gotta just put on the game face. I gotta act unaffected. I gotta act like none of this is bothering me when deep down it's destroying us. And what I see in Naomi and what I hear in Katie is we got to be willing to battle the bitter. And that's not always easy to do. Here we go. Number two, we got to be aware. Be aware. Be aware. I love the words you use. Be aware of our identity and be aware of our theology. This is so key. Katie, I love how you, you're vulnerable and sharing. Here's what my thoughts and my doubts were. But here's how the enemy came at me in this cancer fight. Here's what I started thinking about myself. Here's what I started thinking about God. Come on, who am I? Identity. Who is God? Theology. You know what? When you're facing circumstances, it's going to force you to identity and theology. How about instead of us being afraid to go there, how about we go there? Mm-hmm. and wrestle there mm-hmm. because I guarantee you, you are growing more now in your faith mm-hmm. because of the cancer fight than you were months earlier before this cancer fight. Absolutely. And yet in this, I was thinking about how we talked about this and, and, and I know Katie, you've been on our scene teaching for years and there was a teaching that came out when we were talking about this Sunday, preparing for this. You told me about an alpha, you teaching people about how to trust God and how we've been made, wonderfully and fearfully made and how we have a body, how we have a soul and how we have a spirit. And, and you say, even times you're talking to people that aren't Christians, Listen, you can block out the spirit side and says it doesn't believe it and you can block it out, but look at what you're also blocking out when you do that. And you teach on this. When you taught that and we were talking about that, I'm saying that's money right there. <laughs> Our church needs to hear that today. Maybe this is the whole reason we have this sermon so you can hear this teaching that she used to give an alpha out of Romans chapter eight. Come on, do that real quick with this. I, w- I would love to, only because this really, when I remembered this in my dark days, It helped me, so maybe it would help you. Um, And this is the shortened version. You're gonna have to sign up for Alpha if you want the full (laughs) version because I gotta say this quick. Okay, God, when he created human beings, he made us triune beings, body, soul, and spirit. And if you think of your soul as your mind, your will, and your emotions, sometimes scripture will refer to that as the heart 
or it'll call it maybe the inner man. Kind of uses these words interchangeably. Um, and then think of your body, not just as your physical body, but that fleshly nature inside of all of us that we want what we want when we want it, yeah. <laughs> right? Okay, and then there's a spiritual part to us also. So when God makes Adam and Eve, he makes them fully alive, both physically and spiritually. And in scripture, the word life has a connotation of being in union with. And there's two different words used. The first one is bios, and it means when your physical body is in union with your soul, you are physically alive. Obviously, when that's severed, you're dead. But then there's another word, Zoe. And that means when your soul and your spirit is in union with God's spirit, then you are spiritually Spiritually alive, alive, okay? So God creates Adam and Eve, and it says he, he breathes his spirit into them. You see them walking in unity with him. So they're physically and spiritually fully alive. But then he warns them about the tree in the garden, says don't eat of it or you will surely die. We all know they disobeyed him, they ate. They didn't drop dead physically. So what died? That spiritual oneness with God. That that part of them died and that they couldn't pass on to their own offspring what they no longer had. So every human being from then on is born physically alive, but spiritually dead. That's why scripture says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's why Jesus Christ said, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what? (laughs) I can't crawl back up into my mother's womb, can I? And to paraphrase Jesus, he's like, no, no, you're thinking bios. I'm talking Zoe. Zoe. You need to come fully alive spiritually. Spiritually. And so really, Todd, to to battle bitter, it's got to start with receiving the Holy Spirit into your spirit. And, and some of you here, all of you here are physically alive, duh. <laughs> you wouldn't be breathing. But some of you might not be spiritually alive yet. And really all it takes is understanding who Jesus Christ is, why he came, and what he did for you personally. Embracing that, then he sends his Holy Spirit and you are fully alive in union with him. Okay, so some of you are like, well, I have the Holy Spirit, but I still battle bitter. bitter. I get that. And then this is what helped me. In Romans 8, basically it is instructing us, if you can set your mind on the things of the Spirit, you will find life and peace, that abundant, joyful life that Jesus Christ came to give us. But if you set your mind on the things of the flesh, you're gonna reap death. Mm -hmm. Again, not physical death, you're not gonna drop dead, but death to the things that Christ wants for you. Death to joy, death to peace, death to love. So when cancer and the, the chemo in my darkest days, my emotions, would be primary and flood my mind with this darkness. And I refused to set my will on the things of the spirit because it was just easier to set my mind on what was happening to me, how awful I felt, how ugly I looked, how worthless. And it just dragged me down. But if I could set my will, on the things of the yeah, spirit. That's good. And, and there were days where I would just force myself and I would remember, oh, God is for me. He's with me. He's not against me. And I'd remember his character, his truth, his word, his scripture. Some me- measure of joy and peace would always, would always come. Sure, sure. 
you know, I was thinking about even the fruit of the spirit and what you're talking and that mm-hmm. contrast in there oh. and how when we get with the flesh, it says in Galatians 5 that, that these outcomes, these consequences, mm-hmm. but when we focus on spirit, we get what? Love, joy. joy. There it is. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith. That's the birthing of what God wants to yeah. do in us and through us. Listen, isn't this teaching good? Doesn't this help us as we're kind of putting our mind in the right place? Listen, listen, what I love about that is, is, is without Jesus, we are left alone to our circumstances and our emotions. Mm-hmm. But in Jesus, we get to counter those things. Without putting our minds on God and on his word, the default is always the flesh. And when we put it on the flesh, we will always get stuck in bitter. Mm -hmm. But yet, Naomi, she pushes past her circumstances. She pushes past what she was thinking and feeling. She returns home. Listen, maybe we see it that way. What do we see how she needed people? And that actually leads us to our last point. If you want to write this down, come on, write this down. Both campuses, come on, friends, write this down. Number three, break out and break in. Come on. Number three, break out and break in. Break out of isolation and break into community. As I was thinking about this, Katie, and your cancer battle, that you shared how you got tempted to isolate. Now, I I bet some of it was just the physical exhaustion, the physical just what you felt. You didn't even want to get out of bed. And when you feel horrible, the last thing you want is somebody in that with you, that space with you. But beyond the physical, you even said how emotionally it separated you from what you normally do. And, and if y'all know anything about Katie, she is an extreme extrovert. <laughs> I mean, extreme extrovert, close talking Katie, man, she boom, she's there, right? But with Katie, with Katie, you shared that you were actually living out the opposite when you were walking through this. Mm -hmm. And isn't that exactly Mm -hmm. what the devil wants to do to us? He wants us to feel alone in the fight. Mm -hmm. And man, he was doing that to Mm -hmm. you over time. So tell me this, how did you break out and break in? How did you break out of isolation and break into community even when you didn't feel like it? And how did community maybe break in with you Uh over this course of these months of fighting cancer? Kind of in a a myriad of ways, but, but truthfully, it would have been a lot easier to just watch TV and sleep. Um, but I knew at, at some level, and I think, I think it was the Holy Spirit too, coaxing me, this will be terrible. Y- you will not recover joy if you, if you do this. So um, like Naomi, if you, if, if you s- recognize in her story at the very beginning when Ruth comes to her and says, I want to go with you. I want your people to be my people. And that famous declaration of unconditional uh, Uh, love for Naomi. Naomi at first pushes her away and says, no, no, go back. Go back to your own people. And I think Naomi's thinking, I'm not worth it. Don't hang around with me. I'm bitter. And so at the beginning of my diagnosis, people wanted to help and I'm like, no, 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 no. You, you people don't take your important time uh, to help me. I'm not worth it. Don't bother. And then kind of the reverse of, it, not reverse, but another thing was kind of pride. Like, wait a minute. Hmm. I, I like to be the helper. <laughs> I, I like to help people. It was hard. Receiving in, yeah. And so I was like, no, 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 and kind of wanting to isolate until God showed me. If you cannot receive unconditional love from people, love that you're not out there supposedly earning, then you cannot receive unconditional love from me. That was revolutionary. And I had to let people in. And so family and friends flooded. Many of you prayed and prayed for me. You literally ushered me into the arms of Jesus when I couldn't get there myself. Um, and it was beautiful. It, 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 it was just so restorative to actually receive all that. Now. Uh, some other things that took a little 
more. I had been part of this small prayer group and they decided we're driving to your house once a week. We don't care how you feel or what you look like, we're coming over. And they would listen to me moan and groan and self-pity and yet they would pray for me and they would remind me of God's faithfulness and goodness. Our, our podcast team, they would come over every week and they would let me still be part of this podcast even though I had chemo fog and, and my brain wasn't really operating. And, they never knew what was going to come out on these episodes, but they let me be part of it anyway. And so week after week, I would hear other women's stories of tragedy turned into triumph through faith. And that was incredible. And, and people would come, and if I was too sick to get out of bed... Literally, they would just get in bed with me wow. and we'd make episodes. So um, uh, one other specific thing, this fall, I couldn't join a women's Bible study. And I was so grieved because truthfully, ever since I got saved way back, like 23, I have always been in some kind of women's small group Bible study. That's where I grow the best. But I couldn't this fall. And then God sent this woman who had heard me teach at Alpha. She didn't really even know me. And she sent me this book that was absolutely amazing. And she said, and now I'm going to set up an online community. She has friends all over the world. She's in some kind of international uh, ministry. And we're going to, we'll talk about the book just online. Mm -hmm. I am telling you, these women are from different countries. They had different accents, obviously different upbringing, different uh, ways they're living out their lives. Every single one of us in some way was struggling with identity and theology because all of us had some kind of crucial outer conflict going on that was stirring up inner conflict. But at the same time, we were all committed we are going to stay in community That's no good. matter what it takes. We're going to stay with people who are following the one true God and are looking at truth, and it'll make, it'll make a difference. Mm -hmm. So I forgive you, Todd, for thinking <laughs> I was old and bitter. I could say, <laughs> your words, not mine, not mine. <laughs> hey, church family, both cameras, let's tell Katie how encouraged we are. Let's be encouragement to her today. Thank you. Thank you. Love you, brother. Hey, listen, as our worship team comes in right here, I want to read one final verse because I think it's significant. It's the last sentence in this chapter. And listen, God's word has been clear to us today, but I want you to hear something because you might miss the significance of this moment. It says this in verse 22. It says, so Naomi, come on, Naomi returned. That's huge. She didn't feel like it. She wasn't thinking that, but she returned. She returned from Moab and she didn't just return by herself. She came accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law. Arriving in, come on, say it with me. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. As the barley harvest was beginning. Come on, this last verse is significant. Don't miss it. Don't rush past it. Come on, I want you to see something here. 10 years earlier, 10 years earlier, Naomi left with her husband and her two sons and they, they left to go figure life out on their own. 10 years later, she leaves a famine and now she returns at the barley harvest. Did you pay attention to that? Listen, we started by taking inventory in all the circumstances of Naomi and we're ending the chapter and ending this message, taking the inventory of what now Naomi has and maybe had all along and she's now seeing it. Can I just say it this way? Listen, bitter will always block blessing. But in this is so strong when I see it this way and I want you to see it this way. Listen, what did she have? Naomi realized I'm still alive. I'm getting to come home. You know what she's realizing? My God, that's so, I felt so far away. He's not far away. He's here. He's faithful. He's brought me home to Bethlehem. And not only did I not come back alone, I came back with Ruth. 
God has given me somebody that's sticking with me and reminding me that there's a new beginning happening. There's a new hope happening. Come on, something's about to change in her. And I want you to see the courage of this chapter with Naomi because I'm just believing today, God is speaking directly to somebody here today. Somebody here today, somebody at Freshburg today, down online today is facing cancer. Maybe you're in that dark part of the story of cancer or you're in that chemo battle and that darkness, that enemy is coming on you and he's relentless. I'm here to tell you today, God is not far. He's here, he's here, and he wants to meet you in that. Some of y'all, you know what? You can experience that first part of the story, the financial challenging part of that story. That's your story today. And you're feeling defeated in that. You're feeling embarrassed in that. And yet God is loving you to say, you know what? I'm here, I'm here. Some of you today are relationally wounded. And God says that joy that you think's impossible, is about to be yours. Come on, some of you are in the loss today. This is your first, your first Christmas. Maybe it's not the first, but every Christmas when it rolls around, you're reminded of who's not gonna be here with you. Listen, you wanna know joy? No joy, no joy, no joy, no joy, no joy. What do you want this Christmas to be? Because if you wanna really know joy, you got to know how to battle bitter. Has God spoken to somebody here today? Father God, I thank you for how on time your words are to us, your people, your church. And God, I just believe today somebody needs to begin with you, a relationship. I love it. Katie said, until you get in Jesus, you never know what that spirit life can bring into your life. And that's where the hope is found. That's where the joy is found. That's where the peace is found. It's in the spirit. Oh, Father, there's so many believers today and we need to put our mind on you because our circumstance is a mess. And when we root our life and our circumstances, life can become bitter. But God, you have spoken today that when our life is in faith, we can experience joy no matter our circumstances. And God, I believe you wanna give that to somebody here today. If we're willing to receive it, may we know joy this Christmas. It's in Jesus that I pray for each person listening. May we take a step of courage today towards you. In Jesus we pray, amen.